right, so this is chapter six, part two. Um, we're going to look at some different transport processes in the cells. We have passive and active processes. Simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion are both examples of passive processes. Uh, basically, um, it's the movement of molecules um, with the concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration without the need for energy. Active transport um, is a type of movement uh, that is driven by ATP. Um, and there's several different types of active transport um, and we're going to uh, mention these on the few following slides here. So the transport of nutrients against the diffusion gradient or the, or the concentration gradient, um, the presence of specific membrane proteins is needed in order for this to happen and again there is some energy involved in order for it to happen. Okay, we have endocytosis, phagocytosis, and pinocytosis. These are types of um, transport to bring substances into the cell. So endocytosis is when the cell will actually enclose the substance into its membrane and it'll form a vacuole um, and engulf the substance. Uh, phagocytosis is accomplished by amoebas and white blood cells. Um, and they will actually ingest whole cells or large pieces of matter. And then pinocytosis is the ingestion of liquids. Um, so taking in liquids or sampling liquids from the environment, from outside of the cell, bringing it into the cell. All right, cardinal temperature. So um, this is pretty straightforward. So we have a range of temperatures for the growth of a given microbial species. So basically the, the temperatures they prefer um, so minimum temperature, maximum temperature, and optimum, optimum temperature, excuse me. So minimum is the lowest temperature that permits a microbe to grow. Um, a maximum temperature is the highest temperature at which the microbe will grow um, without it being uh, destroyed or denatured, or the proteins denatured rather. Um, and then there's the optimum temperature, which is basically its happy medium. It's, it's the it promotes the fastest rate of growth and metabolism. So you should know these terms and what they mean. Okay, so psychrophiles, these guys are crazy because they prefer cold temperature, right? That's how I remember is that one. Um, not, not all people that uh, like cold temperatures are crazy, but this is how I remember these bugs because uh, they are called psychrophiles, therefore they prefer colder temperatures. Um, their optimum temperature is below 15 degrees C, and they can actually grow at zero degrees Celsius. Um, so these guys are, are more of a problem um, in, uh, in the refrigerator, right? So uh, natural habitats of psychrophilic bacteria, fungi, and algae, algae are lakes, rivers, snowfields, polar ice, and the deep ocean. So these guys, um, are rarely pathogenic. Okay, psychrotrophs, not the same as psychrophiles. Okay, these guys grow slowly um, in the cold but have an optimum temperature between 15 and 30. Um, the culprits here are going to be Staph Staphylococcus aureus and Listeria, monocytogenes. Um, these are able to grow at a refrigerator temperature and are well known for causing foodborne illnesses. So be sure to associate Staphylococcus aureus and Listerius, Listeria monocytogenes um, being associated with foodborne illnesses. Mesophiles, majority of medically significant microorganisms. So that's bolded and made really big. I would expect you to know that mesophiles are medically significant microorganisms. These, grow, these guys grow between 20 and 40 Celsius. Um, they inhabit animals and plants as well as soil and water. Um, the human pathogens have the optimal, the ones that will make people sick, um, have an optimal temperature between 30 and 40 degrees Celsius. Which, if you don't already know this, they, these, this is relatively close to body temperature. So, um, well, let me go back. So 37 is body temperature. All right, so thermoduric. Microbes can survive short exposure to high temperatures, but are normally mesophiles. So these are common contaminants of heated or pasteurized foods. So examples are heat-resistant endospore formers, such as Bacillus and Clostridium. 
So again, remember that bacillus and clostridium are thermoduric and that they are contaminants of heated or pasteurized foods. Thermophiles, these guys like hotter temperatures and they grow optimally at temperatures greater than 45 degrees Celsius. We find those in volcanic activity, compost piles, and so on. All right, so gases um, in relation to microbes, uh, microbes fall into one of three categories as related to, um, to gases, um, those that use oxygen and detoxify it, those that can neither use oxygen nor detoxify it, and those that do not use oxygen but can detoxify it. So atmospheric gases that influence microbial growth are oxygen and carbon dioxide. So oxygen has the greatest impact on microbial growth, and oxygen is an important respiratory gas and a powerful oxidizing agent. So how microbes process oxygen. So this is a little background on what we're going to talk about next. So as oxygen enters cellular reactions, it is transformed into several toxic products. Singlet oxygen, superoxide ion, hydrogen peroxide, and the hydroxyl radical. So um, just being familiar with these terms and knowing that these guys are toxic. These are four toxic things um, when we're talking about microbes processing oxygen. So in other words, these are byproducts. Okay, that's my word. They're like byproducts. All right, so oxygen usage and tolerance patterns in microbes. So we have aerobes. These guys use oxygen um, in their metabolism and possess the enzymes needed to process those byproducts that we just mentioned in the last slide. So an organism that cannot grow without oxygen is called an obligate aerobe. So you should know what an aerobe is, and you should also know what an obligate aerobe is. Examples include fungi, protozoa, and many bacteria. Microaerophiles, they are harmed by normal atmospheric concentrations of oxygen, but they do require a little bit, just a micro amount, right? So uh, they, they require a small amount of it in their metabolism. And these uh, examples of these bugs, organisms, um, they live in the soil or the water or in a host, a mammalian host, um, that are not directly exposed to the atmosphere. Facultative anaerobes. Notice that there's an anaerobe there, not aerobes, but we're talking about anaerobes. These guys do not require oxygen for metabolism, but use it when it is present. Okay, anaerobes lack the metabolic enzyme systems for using oxygen and respiration. So obligate anaerobes lack the enzymes for processing toxic oxygen and will die in its presence. Um, examples are many oral bacteria and intestinal bacteria. Aerotolerant seem like they're pretty tolerant to something. So these are aerotolerant anaerobes. They do not utilize oxygen but they can tolerate it. They can survive and grow to a limited extent in its presence. Um, these are not harmed by oxygen, mainly because they possess alternate, alternate mechanisms for breaking down those byproducts. Um, certain lactobacilli and streptobacilli are in the, that category. Capnophiles, these are organisms that grow best in higher CO2 environments. Um, it, that is normally present in the, in the atmosphere. Um, it's important in the in initial isolation of the following organisms from clinical specimens. So these guys like uh, carbon dioxide, Neisseria, Brucella, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. pH, um, defined as a degree of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. That's 0 to 14. Um, is the pH scale with 7 being neutral um, and as the pH value decreases towards 0 the acidity increases so the lower the pH the more acidic something is and the higher the pH the more alkaline it is so the majority of organisms live or grow in habitats between 6 and 8 so generally speaking they like it kind of close to neutral However, there are extremes. So acidophiles 
are organisms that thrive in acidic environments. And some examples are here, the Euclina mutabilis, uh, likes acid pools between pH of zero and one, which is extremely acidic. The thermoplasma lives in coal piles at a pH of one or two. Pycrophiles, or sorry, pycrophilus um, lives in a pH of 0.7, so that's below a one. And many molds and yeasts tolerate acidic uh, environments. <coughs> and um, the, the molds and yeasts are what will spoil pickled foods. So we have alkalinophiles, okay, these guys thrive on the opposite end of the pH scale. Um, Proteus can create an alkaline condition to neutralize urine and colonize and infect the urinary system. Osmophiles live in habitats with high solute concentration, so very concentrated, uh, you know, uh, area that they prefer to live in. Halophiles prefer high salt concentrations. Um, obligate halophiles include halobacterium and halococcus, and these grow at solutions up to 25% sodium chloride, um, but require at least a 9% sodium chloride solution or uh, environment to live. Um, facultative halophiles are resistant to salt even though they do not normally reside in high salt environments and then Staphylococcus aureus can grow on a sodium chloride media ranging from 0.1 to 20, a whopping 20 percent which is pretty pretty high. So radiation uh, phototrophs use visible light rays as an energy source. Um, Non-photosynthetic microbes tend to be damaged by the toxic oxygen products produced by contact with light. So some microbial species produce yellow carotenoid pigments in order to absorb and dismantle that toxic oxygen. Sometimes we use UV light um, in microbial control, and you've probably seen that in the lab when we take care of uh, those goggles. Alright, so I'm going to stop this here and we'll pick up with part three of chapter six.